What's going on, y'all? It's Grant Moss. I've been away for a while. I've had a lot of things that I had to, to take care of. And on top of that, I'm trying to reconstruct the channel, trying to make it more professional. And it's going to take a lot of work. I have a long road ahead of me. So I'm basically in the groundwork phases of it right now. But I didn't want it to be too much longer before I put out another video. I know it's been a while since I put some heat out in the web. But basically what I want to do is put together a chain of videos called Surviving Christianity. And basically that's to reach the people that believe on Christ but are far off. You know, people that believe on Christ but they want to learn more but really don't have an outlet to do so. And on top of that, it, it really extends to a, a very um, wide array of things. But it's intended to to bring people to the truth of Christ, those people that are searching. Now, of course, anybody that, that want to view the videos, of course, they're they allowed to. But that's pretty much what it's for. So it's not going to be a lot of bells and whistles as I normally do in my videos, the past three Hebrew Israelite videos. But it's just going to be... Mm, I can't really say what it's going to be, but you'll like it, though. You know, it's not going to be a dull video. But the first thing I want to get into is a little portion of what I like to call defending thyself. And this is pretty much a part of the, the whole surviving Christianity deal. And on this, I'm pretty much going to use arguments coming from different, uh, whether, it's, whether it's like a religious point of view or a uh, free thinking point of view, just anything that is against the, the Christian beliefs. Any things that that people that are Christians might come come against or might be met in opposition with that they don't know the answers to or how to effectively refute. So we're going to kick this off with atheism and we're going to use this female's name. Uh, we're going to use her videos to show you some arguments that you might encounter with atheists on the street. So this female's name is Atheist Minority and uh, she she's pretty popular on the web and other social media outlets that she has but we're going to use her as an example of how to effectively debunk uh, atheists and their arguments so uh, it's, it's going to be a really good video you know it's going to be a, a good level of heat and uh, you will like it so here we go overcoming atheism let's start with the genealogy of Joseph Jesus's father Old Testament prophecy state that the Messiah will be a direct descendant of King David. The only two Gospels that mention the lineage of Jesus are Matthew and Luke. Matthew starts with Abraham and moves forward through David to Joseph. Luke, on the other hand, starts with Joseph and moves backwards all the way to God. Now, the two genealogies are pretty similar all the way up until David. At this point, they wildly diverge. This is because Matthew traces Joseph from David's son Solomon, whereas Luke traces Joseph from David's son Nathan. In Matthew chapter 1 verses 15 and 16, it's stated that Joseph's great-grandfather is Eleazar. His grandfather is Methan and his father is Jacob. But in Luke chapter 3 verses 23 and 24, Jacob's great-grandfather is listed as Levi. His grandfather is Mathot, and his father is Heli. These are two completely different lines to David. Not only that, but Matthew claims 28 generations separating King David from Jesus Christ. When you count the names given in Luke, the genealogy comes to 41 generations for that same period. In my last video, one of the things that I covered was the genealogy of Joseph and the fact that he has two different fathers based on whether you're reading Matthew or whether you're reading Luke. Now, because I had researched this prior to making the video, I knew that somebody was going to say that the reason why Joseph has a different father listed in the book of Luke is because that genealogy is not for Joseph, but really it's for Mary. So 
So first of all, what we should realize of why there are two different lines to David is because these are two different direct descendants of David, meaning his sons. So these are two out of four sons that David had with Bathsheba, Nathan and Solomon. Secondly, the difference between the amount of generations in the genealogies, 28, 41, is as follows. Every time you see a genealogy in the Bible, and the Bible has quite a few genealogies, it doesn't always go from, let's say, great-grandfather to grandfather to father to son. That's not how all genealogies go. Now, even the term begat in the Bible it can sometimes mean the ancestor of. So they're not always putting, you know, as I mentioned before, you know, grandfather, father, son in that order. Now, on top of that, as far as the, the genealogy she gave in Luke, um, she was basically saying that some people have the argument of saying that the genealogy in Luke was Mary's, but however, Mary's name wasn't in there now you, you gotta think this this isn't you know a, a new age type deal you know this isn't the new age era like it is now of how you know they're effeminizing men and making a woman more masculine so back in these times it was the other way around you know uh gender uh was more in its proper place and when i say that i'm not talking about making women second class citizens and all that type of stuff but Basically, the genealogies were male dominated. So every time you turn around in the Bible and you see the genealogy, there were always males. It was it's never this female begat this male. Well Mary begat Moses or anything like that. Genealogies were always male dominated, so they're not going to have uh any female in the Bible begatting anyone. believe strongly that I already have enough to debunk our current claim or these types of claims from atheists but basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to dig a little deeper to close it out just in case so one thing you want to realize about the four gospels is that they all serve a different purpose the purpose of Matthew was to show the Jews that Jesus Christ was the promised king from the Old Testament books this is why the uh, the genealogy starts from Abraham going to Joseph to show that Jesus Christ was a, a full-blooded uh, Hebrew or Israelite. Not only a full-blooded Hebrew or Israelite, but from the priest, not the priest, but the kingly line or royal line of David, in which Jesus Christ is through Joseph. So this is why it's that way, and this is why these individuals were specifically listed from Matthew. Now, the book of Luke relates more to showing Jesus as the perfect human and savior. And not, not only that, but it was also written and more geared towards Gentiles. However, it was inclusive to Jews, just as Matthew was inclusive to Gentiles. However, the overall premise was to write to the Gentiles to show them the, uh, show them the gospel and whatnot. Now, an interesting thing is that there was a man in the book of Jeremiah called Jechonias. And basically, God had cursed the line of Jechonias that none of his descendants would sit on the throne and rule in Judah. However, Jesus Christ, being the legal, the legal heir through Joseph, didn't fit this biologically because the curse was a biological curse. So, just to do a recap, both Mary and Joseph, they were descendants of David. But Jesus Christ was the heir to the throne of David through Joseph and before Jesus was born both Joseph and Mary were married so hopefully um, hopefully that should do it but I also want to make another point this is coming from Tyndale Life Application Bible King James this is basically one of the the notes all right Matthew breaks Israel's history into three sets of 14 generations 
but there were probably more than those listed here. Genealogies often compress history, meaning that not every generation of ancestors was specifically listed. Thus the word begat can also be translated was the ancestor of. So I think that covers everything concerning this topic. Jesus was condemned, Judas went back to the chief priests and the elders to return the 30 pieces of silver he had received for his treachery, and then he went and hanged himself. The priest took the silver and, calling it blood money, used it to buy the potter's field as a burial place for strangers. And that is why, according to Matthew, this field is called the field of blood. The book of Acts tells a different story. In this account, Judas himself buys the field with the rewards of his wickedness. Swelling up, he burst open and all of his bowels gushed out. According to the book of Acts, that incident is why the field is so named. And then we have Paul, who tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 5 that after his resurrection, Jesus appeared to the twelve. That number therefore included Judas. Not to mention the fact that according to Mark and Luke, Jesus revealed himself to the eleven following his resurrection. Which disciple was missing from this wondrous occasion told in the two Gospels? Well, after the events that we've just heard about, you'd think it was Judas, right? Wrong. The missing disciple was none other than the infamous Doubting Thomas. So the main argument is that there's a contradiction between the gospel accounts of Jesus' appearance at his resurrection to the disciples as opposed to 1 Corinthians and what Apostle Paul is talking about. The first thing we have to realize is that the account in 1 Corinthians, that letter, the setting of that letter, the time period was a little further along than it was in the four Gospels. So in the four Gospels, Saul isn't even mentioned. Saul isn't mentioned until the book of Acts, which is after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we have to understand that. And that's going to be very key in debunking her argument or the argument of, of some atheists. So let's go to... I want to go to... Let's go to the book of Acts, chapter 1, and start at verse 15. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, The number of names together were about 120. So around this time period, there were 120 disciples. But what a lot of people overlook is that even in the midst of the Gospels, Jesus Christ had already appointed himself 70 disciples. So there were more disciples than just the, the 12 apostles. That's the key thing. Now let's skip down to verse 21. Wherefore of these men which have companied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. And they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship, from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Okay, so I'm going to read one more scripture. And um, this one's very important. So I'm just going to go back over this one. Wherefore of these men, which have company with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. Okay. 
So they end up choosing Matthias. So hopefully you, you caught that. But what Peter said is that which one of these men company with us all the time that Jesus went in and out from among us. This man was Matthias. So when Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians that he appeared unto the twelve, this is who he's talking about. Now she said that Judas was Judas was uh, alive around that time when Jesus appeared unto them and that's completely bogus. Jesus Christ himself had words for Thomas who didn't believe that he resurrected. So let's go to John chapter 20. John chapter 20, verse 26. And after eight days again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. So, Jesus did this because Thomas, in a few scriptures earlier, said he wouldn't believe unless he was able to do what Jesus allowed him to do. At this point, Judas was, was already dead. And the truth of the matter is, if Jesus Christ took the consideration not only to to visit Thomas, but to address exactly what he wanted him to address, why wouldn't he have any words for Judas? Certainly, I'm pretty sure, I'm very sure that if Judas was there, then he would have some words for Judas, but Judas wasn't there. But one of the other arguments was the, uh, the two accounts about the, the field of blood. I mean, either way you look at it, to me, I, I don't know if this is a, a big enough issue to to really address, but even if we go ahead and address it, you know, when Judas came back and threw the money on the floor and cited the religious leaders, they didn't take that money. They didn't take the money at all. So even if they bought the field, which the Bible says, even if they bought the field, they still bought it with Judas's money. So once again, I don't know if that was a big enough issue to entertain, but the other one as far as the two different occurrences of the Gospels and how they mentioned that it was 11 apostles and further along the time span uh, not only were they mentioned Saul but when Saul is converted into Apostle Paul and he's now writing letters to the churches in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 those are two different time periods so of course around the Gospels Matthias was not labeled an apostle yet but by the time that Apostle Paul was writing letters to the Corinthians to the Galatians Matthias was already elected as an apostle by then. So that's why it says he's appeared unto the twelve. I challenge you to find any place in the Bible where the divinity of Jesus Christ is explicitly stated. You won't find it. It has to be inferred from ambiguous verses. Now I ask you, do you follow the Holy Bible? Or do you believe man-made doctrine? Think carefully and do your research before you answer that. In the meantime, here's what Jesus Christ has to say about it. Okay, so basically I have a, uh, a pocket full of scriptures to easily debunk this argument. But first what we're going to do is we're going to go back to John. 2028. 20, All right. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. This is pretty basic. This is pretty straight to the point. I don't know how she managed to throw this in there. And that if you notice, it was the last one she threw in there. And this is something that politicians do. You know, they might hit you with two or three things that are relevant, true. And then they start coming in with the lies or a lie. It would not, I don't know the scientific term for it, but it's definitely a uh, a speaking technique. But this scripture right here isn't ambiguous at all. Now, all the other stuff she said, you know, I mean, it's still not even ambiguous, to be honest. But coming from her standpoint, I guess I could relate to that. But this scripture right here, this is pretty blatant. He called him my Lord and my God. That's pretty blatant. Okay. 
So let's go to John 10. Starting at 15. As the Father know of me, even so I, the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. The other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, Gentiles, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice. And there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore doth my father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received my father. So the key phrase you want to listen to is, I lay down my life. I lay it down on myself. Which to make a long story short, talking about laying down his life for the sheep. Now let's drive it home. All right. Hereby, verse 16, hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. Who? God. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Now, also, this is something that people do. Like, they read scripture, but they don't read above it or beneath it. So, we're going to go ahead and do the, uh, I, <laughs> I don't want to say above, below test, because then people probably start talking about I'm, I'm a mason or something like that. Anyway. Okay, the one above it says, Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. 17. But whoso have this world's good, and see if his brother have need, and shut up his bowels of compassion from him, how to the love of God in him. Okay, so I'm definitely, definitely not going to call it the above below test. Definitely not. Not trying to link myself with that stuff. But, um, however, to be brutally honest, in situations like this, just to make sure you get the context right, you want to read the scripture on top of it, and you want to read the one beneath it. You, you have to. All right. So, because he laid down his life for us. So, who was in the Gospels, in the Gospel of John, talking about explicitly laying his life down? It was Jesus. All right. So let's go to even the Old Testament book. Let's go to Isaiah 9-6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. We all know that's Jesus. There's only one person that died for the sins of the world. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, explicit, the Everlasting Father, explicit. The Prince of Peace. Explicit, okay? So there's nothing ambiguous about the scriptures that I just gave. Now we're going to attack her argument or further pepper her argument as far as the misinterpreted scriptures she gave in Matthew 15 verse 9. But in vain they do worship me. Teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Religion, okay? So Christ is not Christ didn't die on the cross for religion. He died on the cross to bring man back to himself. That's not religion. People over and over again say, oh, Christianity is just, a, just another religion. You know, nevertheless, these are people that are not even in it. So why would I expect them to know? Why would you expect them to know? Okay, but the people that he was talking about here were um, what you call Pharisees and uh, Sadducees. What is this? Oh, okay, but um, they were the, the Pharisees, Sadducees, you know, those were the major religious groups around at that time, and basically, you know, just like a lot of, you know, so-called religious people, you know, you know how to do the basic stuff right, the outer stuff right, the stuff that, I guess it, it's relevant to a degree, but it's not the core of the issue when it comes to the core of the things like loving somebody you know loving God the the core things living right those things the Pharisees and Sadducees weren't doing but the outer stuff the petty stuff you know um, the things that you do with the body but have nothing to do with the heart you know you can come to church you can slide your amens in and your hallelujahs wherever you you know to slide them but that stuff doesn't say anything about your heart you know and these were the people who they were talking about, who Jesus was talking about. These people were hypocrites. 
You know, the same people that claim to be religious and, and holy and all that stuff end up plotting the murder of Jesus. So these are the people he was talking about. Okay, but in vain do they worship me. So the way that she spoke of it was that people are wrong for worshiping Jesus. So we're going to bust that argument wide open. So when you run into people like this, you have something to hit them with. Because to be brutally honest, um, you do have Christians out there, man, that don't read the Bible. That's actually a commandment to uh, allow the word of God to dwell in you richly. And that's in Colossians. I think it's chapter 3. I don't know. But it's, it's in there. It's in there. But anyway. Matthew chapter 2 verse 11. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with his mother, with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, and frankincense, and myrrh. Okay? Now, um... I don't know if it was her video that says something about, you know, the story of the wise men coming to see Jesus was copied. I don't know if it was her video. So I've seen quite a few videos on people trying to debunk the Bible, but it was some video that someone had and they were talking about how this story was a copy from another story that, that was talking about three wise men. But hearing this story it doesn't say how many wise men it was. So it's horrible. It's horrible. To the trained eye and to the person that really reads that Bible, there's really no argument that anybody can put together to debunk the Bible. It really isn't. But let's pay attention to the gifts that the wise men brought him. Okay, he says he brought, brought some gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Gold was, was pretty much gifts for a king. Jesus Christ is, is the uh, eternal king will definitely come to set up his kingdom uh, in the near future. Frankincense was a gift recognizing his deity, that he, <laughs> that around the time he was God, this child was God. And myrrh, spice for uh, his death. So these men knew that he was the king, okay? They knew he was the coming king. And I don't even know if these men were Israelites, but they knew that he was gonna be a king. They knew that he was God and is God around this time was God frankincense and they knew they had a purpose of dying for the sins of the world myrrh so even from the direct to the indirect uh, these men knew what was up they knew the deal alright and let's go to more scriptures I'm just going to put in one more for the worship Matthew 28 9 and as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. All hail. That's the type of stuff you only see for royalty or bosses. You know, bow down. Show respect. Alright? So the same, the same uh, connection with Matthew 2.11. As far as the reason why they gave him the gifts. Okay, so these disciples, uh, these people worship him. Okay, so the scripture that she misinterpreted uh, wasn't saying that Jesus Christ was saying that, yeah, people worship me, although they're not supposed to. You'll find out all throughout the Bible, all throughout the Gospels, people were worshiping him because they knew who this guy, this guy was. They knew who he was. All right, Acts 14, verse 11, we're going to start with. And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Laconia, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Uh, not really, but pretty close. Pretty close. And they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius, because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Jupiter, which was before that city, brought oxen and garlands unto the gates, and would have done sacrifice with the people. Which when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of, they rent their clothes, like, Tearing your clothes up back in that time was like it was something serious, like grieving and you know all that other stuff. You know, anger. It, it was a big deal. You know, written there, tearing your clothes up like Hulk Hogan. All right, and ran in among the people, crying out 
and saying, Sirs, why do ye these things? We also are men of like passions with you, and preach unto you that ye should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all the things that are therein. All right. So unlike Jesus, Jesus didn't rent his clothes or tear his clothes up. He let people worship him. There's so many more scriptures in the Gospels alone of people worshiping him. So I think this is it. And as far as this goes, I think that proves my point. And this atheistic argument is debunked. And finally, the number one way to maintain your Christianity, don't read the Bible. Now, I'm not talking about a few verses here and there or the passage that the preacher gives you during the sermon. What I'm talking about is reading the Bible from beginning to end, starting at Genesis and ending with Revelation. Because if you do, you will find that the Old Testament is one big horror story and God shows a lot of human despicable traits. But wait! I know Christians like to ignore the entire Old Testament, so definitely don't read the accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and compare the four Gospels to each other concerning the life and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You will find no less than 30 contradictions and inconsistencies between the four Gospels. And you do know that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are not eyewitness accounts, nor were they actually written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? You know that, right? All right, and I'm back. I'm really feeling this setup, by the way. I just think it's a lot more smoother using the Corel screen capture setup to record voice audio. It's very, um, very smooth, very smooth. I like the way the volume adjusts as well. But she says that the four Gospels wasn't based on eyewitness accounts. And on top of that, that they weren't written by the disciples. So two of these Gospels, Matthew and John, were written by the twelve apostles. Now Luke not only was a physician, but he was a historian as well. So Luke gathered and collected uh, data from those people that were around. Whether they were, you know, apostles, other disciples, etc., etc., of people that were around Christ and whatnot, but Luke wasn't a uh, wasn't one of the original twelve apostles or disciples. In other words, uh, John Mark. All right. But let's go on to. Uh, further showcase this right Okay, this is Luke chapter 1, starting from verse 1. For as much as many have taken in hands to set forth and order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were our witnesses and ministers of the word. Okay, so Luke was a historian and a physician. So that's part of what he did. And he collected the information from our witnesses. All right, so let's go to where's <clears throat> John? Okay, I forgot to add the chapter. All right, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. 
For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was the Father, and was manifested unto us. And notice he's saying we, <laughs> insinuating more than one. Now, John, in 1 John, was written by one of the originals, uh, Apostle John, okay? So, four Gospels were written based upon eyewitness accounts. They all were. And uh, another thing that is that is very influential and very helpful in showcasing that is the writings of the Apostolic Fathers. Now you have people out there that say that you know the Bible isn't enough. You know, the Bible in itself is not enough information. Uh, I don't see how that is, but anyway, a good thing to use to shut down atheistic arguments or doubters of the word is the writings of the, uh, the Apostolic Fathers. The, the Apostolic Fathers were indeed real people. And that's obvious. They were more contemporaries of the, uh, the Twelve Apostles. You know, being under them. Being under the Twelve Apostles. And whatnot. So, the Apostolic Fathers' writings, they're not divine. Don't get me wrong. Granted, they, they uh, cross-reference and they use a lot of, of Bible a lot of Bible. They use a lot of cross references from the, the Old Testament unto the New Testament. But the overall purpose of the writings of the Apostolic Fathers, as far as how they are used, they're used to provide a link to the existence of the Apostles. And we all know that the Apostles followed Christ. So it's a link. It's a secular link that proves the existence of the Apostles. Hence the existence of Jesus Christ. And this is the crazy thing about a lot of naysayers of the Bible. Um, it's pretty much this. People can't. They can't disprove the Bible. They can't do it. For example. People claim that the earth is billions of years old. I, I don't believe that. I don't believe that the earth is billions of years old. And to me it would, it would further hurt the atheistic argument. Because at the billions of years. You know you still haven't found out how everything got here. At the billions of years. You know, whether you say humans weren't around for the whole time or not, still. If you believe that the Earth's been around for billions of years, I, I just think that's pretty that's pretty pathetic that you still haven't found out how everything got here. You know, I think billions of years is enough time <laughs> to find out. But anyway, for example, uh, the, the scriptures clearly state that Jesus ascended and he died and resurrected. So you're telling me that you can find dinosaur bones from billions and billions of years ago, but you can't find the body of Christ. You can't find it. So instead of acknowledging that, they say, oh, well, you know, uh, Christ never existed. Poppycock. Poppycock. Other, other bullocks. Bullcrap. So that, the writings of the Apostolic Fathers definitely provide a link to the apostles, the people that were closest to Christ and his ministry. And linking that to his his uh, existence. So um, I think that'll do it. Hopefully, I didn't go over my forty minute mark. So I'm trying to break these down into uh, forty minutes apiece, at the most. But uh, that should debunk that. that. Should debunk it. But I have another part coming out, so stay tuned. Stick around. I'm gonna go ahead and finish this. Um, I don't know how long it's going to take to put that one out there but it should be up soon alright y'all fight the good fight I'm out